Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve. Thanks for joining us today on From His Heart. You know, when I first became a Christian, I can remember an overwhelming desire to tell other people about Jesus. Have you ever felt like that? You know, the Lord said the last thing before he ascended to heaven, he told his disciples, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. We're in a series called Witness, and we're learning how to shine for Christ and share what great things He has done for us. So grab a Bible, follow along, and prepare your heart for a blessing. In April of 1829, William Booth was born. He was born in England. When he was about 15 years old, he heard the gospel, and he responded to the gospel, and he received Christ as his Savior and Lord. And God put within him a desire to preach, and he was in the Methodist church, and so he began to preach but he was a little unorthodox. He was, he was such an evangelist and such a fiery evangelist and they, they wanted to, to put him in the pastorate, but that really wasn't what he was wired for. And so uh, he just started to become an itinerant evangelist. But he was unorthodox in his uh, ways of doing things. And so the churches of that day said, you know, this really doesn't fit. And so they didn't want to have him come and, and preach. And so... William Booth was undaunted. He said, well, God has called me. I'll just go somewhere else. And so he began to just go out in the open air, go out on the street corners. And he began to preach and people began to respond. But they weren't the normal kinds of people that society deemed as uh, good people. They were kind of the outcasts of society. They were the street folks, they were the prostitutes, and they were the derelicts, and they were the alcoholics, and they were uh, the petty criminals. And they began to listen to Booth, and they began to trust Christ because he preached Jesus, and he preached him crucified, and he preached the empty tomb, and he pre preached repentance, and he preached faith, and the people responded. And then his movement began to grow. And it really didn't have a name. He was just bringing people in. He had a little uh, mission. He'd bring them in and he'd feed them, feed them and he would clothe them and he would take care of them and he'd preach to them and win them to the Lord. And it was in 1865 when God gave him a name for his mission outreach. He called it the Salvation Army. He began to call himself General William Booth. And he began to amass in the Salvation Army officers in the army. And he would let them know, you are soldiers in the Lord's army and we have a mission and that is to seek and to save that which was lost. Boy, he, General William Booth, what a tremendous Christian a beautiful wife, nine children, such a ministry, such a witness for the Lord, just won so many people to Christ. He had a passion for souls. And he recognized this fact that we're in a battle and we're in the Lord's army. When my kids were little, we, Debbie and I, taught them that little children's song, I'm in the Lord's army. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never zoom or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. That's a good children's song because it teaches children at a young age that you're in the army. Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. And what are we fighting for? We're fighting for the souls of men and women, of boys and girls. Well, for the last several weeks, we've been in a series called Witness. God has called us to be his witnesses. He's called us to shine for Christ and to share the story. Share what the Lord has done for us. Share what Jesus 
did when he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And as we finish up this series, I want us to focus on the battle for souls. Paul gives us insight into this battle as he writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians is an interesting letter. Paul had uh, gone back and forth with the Corinthians. He had spent time there in Corinth. Corinth. He built a church there. And that was a troubled, messed up church, but Paul loved those people. And when we read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, those weren't the only two letters Paul wrote to Corinth. Actually, 1 Corinthians is the second letter he wrote. The first letter is lost. We don't have that letter. God didn't include it in his scripture. And then Paul writes 1 Corinthians, which is really the second letter he wrote them. And then he wrote another letter, the third letter. We don't have that one. That's lost too. And then the fourth letter here is 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians, he is defending himself. He's defending his apostleship. He's defending his ministry because false prophets had come in and they had... uh, caused the people to turn away from Paul and they had poisoned the water, so to speak, these false teachers, and they said, well, you know, Paul is just using you. Paul doesn't really care about you. Paul has ulterior motives. And so Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter four. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants, your slaves, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Such a great passage of Scripture. And and here's our question for today that I want to focus our thoughts around. The question is this, how can we be effective soldiers in the battle for souls. See, Paul realized he was a soldier in this battle. He told Timothy in the last letter that he ever wrote, 2 Timothy chapter two, he said, Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Hey, I'm in the Lord's army and I need to be a good soldier. And where is the battle? Well, it's a spiritual battle. It's an invisible battle. We don't wrestle uh, against flesh and blood, the scripture says, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. God has a heart and a desire to save. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which was lost And so when we uh, team up with him, we're part of this battle in the Lord's army to do what? To battle for souls so that men and women and boys and girls can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So how can we be effective in that mission? Three keys that I wanna share with you. First key, we can remember what we have been given. Remember what we have been given. Did you know that so much of preaching is reminding people. It's reminding people not, not necessarily of things they've never heard of. You can't remind people of things they've never heard of. You're reminding them of truth that they've been exposed to, but they have forgotten because we all tend to forget You know, one of the key things that people forget, they come to church, you know what they need to hear? Uh, Pretty much Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, the key thing is that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you because it's so easy to forget that. It's so easy for that to drift far from your mind, for the experience of that to, to drift away from you. 
And so, so much of preaching is just reminding. Peter, in 2 Peter, he talked to the people, uh, the recipients of his letter, and he said, I'm writing these things to remind you so that you'll bring these to remembrance, to stir you up by way of remembrance. He, he said, listen, in your faith, you need to supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness. You need to grow in your faith. He said, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Oh, we have such a tendency to forget. So what's the way that we can be effective soldiers? We can remember what we have been given. Look at verse one again. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we received mercy, we do not lose heart. As we received mercy. What are we supposed to remember in terms of what we've been given? What have we been given? Well, first of all, we have been given undeserved mercy. Undeserved mercy. As we have received mercy, Paul said, we don't lose heart. While God has been so good to us, he has given us his grace, his compassion, his mercy. One of my favorite characters in all the Bible is blind Bartimaeus, the the poor blind beggar in Jericho. And when Jesus passed by, he didn't see him. He's blind, but he heard a commotion and he said, what is all the noise? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And blind Bartimaeus began to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he wouldn't be quiet. And he cried out for mercy, and the Lord called him. First he stopped for a poor poor blind beggar, and then he called Bartimaeus to himself, and he had mercy on Bartimaeus, and he not only gave him his physical eyesight, he gave him spiritual eyesight. He saved his soul. And Bartimaeus was rejoicing as he followed Jesus down the road. Wow. Wow. Wow, mercy, that's what people need. That's what you and I need. That's what we have been given, mercy and God's grace, and we didn't deserve any of it. That's why John Newton wrote, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I didn't deserve your grace, Lord. It's amazing grace. I think we would be safe to say this statement that the Apostle Paul was probably the greatest Christian who ever lived. And some have tried to figure out, well, what made Paul such a great Christian? I think the answer is this. Paul was saved and he never got over it. He he was always so blown away that the Lord would save a wretch like him. That's why he said, hey, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet God had mercy on me. And he saved me the chief of sinners. Wow. And every day he was just like, wow, Lord, you saved me. I loved Dr. Gabby's prayer as he prayed for the offering because in his prayer, he thanked God for saving him. That's something you and I need to do on a regular basis when we get up in the morning. God, thank you for saving me, a wretch like me. I have been given undeserved mercy. So we can remember that. The Lord gave us undeserved mercy. Secondly, we can remember that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He's given us a ministry. He's given us a service. He's given us an office, an assignment. See, it says in verse one, therefore, since we have this ministry, what ministry? He goes on to say in chapter five of 2 Corinthians that it's the ministry of reconciliation. Now, all these things, Paul says, are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. See, that's the same thing as saying you shall be my witnesses. 
But it's, it's kind of an upgrade because you, not only are you my witnesses, but you're my ambassadors. See, what does an ambassador do? Um, an ambassador for the king is somebody who is, speaks on behalf of the king. He goes to another country to speak on behalf of the king. We have ambassadors in, the, in America who go to other countries who live in the consulate or whatever, and they represent America in those countries. We're ambassadors of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords as Christians. Our, this world is not my home. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we are soldiers, yes, in the fight, and we're also ambassadors, and we have a ministry. It is the ministry of reconciliation. We are begging people and imploring people and pleading with people, come to Jesus before it's too late. Be reconciled to God. We have received the mercy. It's undeserved. And we share that grace with other people. Hey, there is grace for you if you'll come to Jesus in repentance of faith. And that is the ministry that God has given us. I remember when I first became a Christian, one of the guys that I used to go drink with and party with he found out that I became a Christian, and here I am. I was a freshman in college at the time. I'd only been a Christian less than a year, and I remember I was going, I went back home to Houston from UT for the weekend, and I was at the Cypress Creek football game and uh, homecoming type game, you know, and, and my friend Kyle was there, and uh, Kyle said to me, he said, I heard you met a man. I said, okay. Didn't really know what he was talking about, you know? I was, met a lot of men. I said, okay. He said, you met a man, didn't you? I said, if you say so. Well, what man did I meet? He said, I heard you met Jesus. I said, oh, that man. Yeah, the son of man. Yeah, I did meet him. And he said, who saved you? I said, that man that you just talked about, Jesus. He saved me. He goes, no, no, no. Oh, who saved you? I said, Jesus. He said, you know, because I knew the right answer for all those questions, Jesus, right? So, no, he said, who saved you? I said, still Jesus. That's still my, that's my final answer, Jesus, you know? And he said, no, what man saved you? I said, what man saved What are you talking about? And he said, who did you talk to that led you to Jesus? I said, oh, that's a totally different question. And I said, this guy. But I, I've never forgotten that. It's been so many years ago. And he was thinking that a man saved me. That there's no human being that saved me. It was the Lord of glory who saved me. Something important to remember in this mission of reconciliation is we don't save anybody. I can't save anybody. You can't save anybody. Billy Graham can't save anybody. Franklin Graham. We can't save anybody. All we can do is point to Jesus who is mighty to save. We sang the song just a little bit ago, Jesus saves, and he is the only one who saves, and our job is to get on mission with him to seek and to save that which was lost, but we can't save, he saves, so we just point the way to Jesus. As someone described evangelism, it's just one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread, and that's what we do, and that's the ministry that God has given us, the ministry of reconciliation, so we can remember not only that we've been given undeserved mercy, that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation, and then we have been given what every person desperately needs. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have truly received mercy. I'm not talking about that you have churchianity. I'm talking about you've been born again, and you have a genuine personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You have exactly what every person you meet desperately needs. Every person outside of Christ, you have what they need. Because every person outside of Christ is on the highway to hell. And the only remedy to get them off the highway is the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Good works don't get you off the highway to hell. Church membership doesn't get you off the highway to hell. Getting baptized doesn't get you off the highway to hell. The only thing that gets you off the highway to hell is to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, and you repent of your sins and you turn to Christ, and that is what saves a person. Now, every person you meet needs that. Every person you meet outside of Christ is one heartbeat away from hell. And the truth of the matter is we don't really think about that very much. 
We don't let that permeate our minds. D.L. Moody was a great soul winner, great evangelist, the Billy Graham of his day. He was having meeting after meeting and just hundreds of people were coming to Christ. Well, he went to London for an evangelistic meeting and some pastors came to his hotel room and they began to ask him a question. They said, uh, Mr. Moody, we don't understand something. He said, you're an uneducated man. You're a very crude man. You know, you're not very erudite in your speaking, yet you're so powerful and so effective. What's the secret? And Moody said to those three pastors, he said, look out my hotel room window and tell me what you see. And so the first man looked out the window and he said, well, I see a park. I see people walking at the park. Second man looked out and he said, well, I see two people on a park bench and somebody walking his dog. Third guy said, well, I see, I see this vendor. He's selling some stuff and just people walking around the park. They said, Moody, what do you see? And Moody walked to the window and he began to look and the tears began to roll down his cheeks. And he said, I see men and women and boys and girls who are on their way to a Christless hell unless they hear about the Savior. That's what I see. And that's why God used him in such a great way, because he understood that everybody he met outside of Christ was in desperate need. And listen, gang, I'm speaking for myself. We lose sight of that. One of the reasons that we don't shine and share like God wants us to is because we lose sight of the fact that there are kids in the high school that are one heartbeat from hell. There are people at your office, one heartbeat from hell. There are neighbors just on either side of you, one heartbeat from hell. And so we don't think about that and we don't look out the window with tears. Paul said, my prayer to God and my heart's desire is for my brethren to come to know Christ, my Jewish Brethren, to come to know Christ. He, he had such a passion. He said, I would rather go to hell myself that they would be saved. That's how much he desired to see them come to know the Lord. William Booth, whom I referenced earlier, General William Booth, he said this. He said, if I had my way, I wouldn't send my officers, my preachers, to seminary or Bible school. He said, my training would be to send them to hell for 24 hours. He said, then they would come back, the fiery preachers and the passionate preachers that they could be, that God wants them to be, because they would realize what awaits every person who rejects Christ. Hey, we can remember what we have been given. That's the first key to being a good and effective soldier in the battle for souls. Secondly, we can make sure our hearts are right with God. Paul is defending himself, as I said, to the Corinthians, and he's letting them know he's no charlatan. The guys that have come in after Paul, those guys were hucksters and charlatans and scammers and greedy and using the people to try and get money and elevating themselves. That wasn't Paul at all. He said, we don't preach ourselves. We preach Jesus Christ and ourselves as slaves for Christ's sake. We're nothing. Those guys keep boasting about how great they are and, and telling you that I'm just a, a charlatan and a huckster. He said, they're the hucksters. They're the charlatans. And verse two in the easy to read version says this, but we have turned away from secret and shameful ways. We don't use trickery and we don't change the teaching of God. We teach the truth plainly. This is how we show people who we are. And this is how they can know in their hearts what kind of people we are before God. Paul lived a life that shined for Jesus Christ. Paul lived a life where the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Jesus was just all over him. And everywhere he went, people would just be, man, something smells great. What is that? Oh, that's the apostle Paul. He has the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Jesus on his life because he's walking with him and he's letting Jesus shine through him. Now, how, do, how does a person do that? Well, you can't shine for Christ if you have secret sin in your life. 
Paul says we have turned away from secret and shameful ways. We've renounced those. We've said no to those things. You know, some people try and shine for Christ. Some Christians try and shine for Christ, but there's mud all over the windows and and the the stains of sin and secret sin and, and things that they're doing and living a double life. And you can't shine if you're living a double life. You can't shine if you're one way on Sunday and a different person at home, a different person during the week, a different person at the office. One guy I knew was a Sunday school teacher in his church, and every time he went out of town, he was so excited because then he could go to the strip joints where people didn't know him. Hey, Paul said, we have turned away from secret and shameful ways. When are we going to learn that sin is not our friend? Sin is not a good thing. The Bible says don't give the devil a place. If you give the devil a toehold in your life, just a little area, just a little crack, and you say, this is just cracked a little for a little bit of sin, because hey, let's be honest, sin is pleasurable. Whether it's getting drunk or getting high or, or sexual immorality or whatever it might be, it's pleasurable. Uh, whether it's, it's seeking revenge on somebody, you know, there's a whole show on television, Revenge, and, and it's just about how I got you back. You know, and so there's pleasure in that. Because the devil's too smart to go fishing without any hook on it, any bait on his hook. So he throws a hook out there that's got some bait on there, something that we want. But when we bite on that, then he reels us in. And then you're hooked and cooked, gutted and grilled. He will mess you over. And you give the devil a toehold, and he turns it into a foothold, and then it becomes a stronghold in your life. Then it's a monkey on your back, and you can't get it off. Just like alcohol, there's an old proverb that says, first the man takes the drink, then the drink takes the drink, then the drink takes the man. And all of a sudden, your life is just consumed. The little poem says, who is it? Knock so low, a lonely little sin. Slip through, I answered, and soon all hell was in. So what do we do? Paul said we renounce those things. We, we get those things out of our lives. We don't let those things hang around in the darkness. We pull those things out into the light and we get accountability and we get a Christian friend that we can trust and we share our hearts with them and say, I'm struggling with X, whatever X might be. See, thin, sin thrives in the darkness, so you have to pull it out into the light. And when you pull it out into the light, God gives the victory. Confess your sins, the scripture says, not only to God, but to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You can't shine for Christ if you have secret sin in your life and you can't make true disciples if you water down the word. That's what he's talking about here. He said, we don't use trickery. The false Apostles that had come into Corinth, they were trying to trick the people. We don't use trickery. We're not scammers. We don't change the teaching of God. We teach the truth plainly. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to water down the word. You know, that's what's going on in, a, in American churches today so often. We see these churches that can have huge crowds of people, but, but there, there's an absence of the word of God. And, and the word of God is kind of a footnote. And they're gonna talk about, well, you know, 10 ways to have a better marriage and, and five ways to, to get ahead at work and whatever it is, but, but there's no scripture. Now, it, it's kind of Christianity light. There's some Christian principles in there, but they're not preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul said, that's what I determined to know nothing among you, he told the Corinthians, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his message because that is the message that saves. And there's pressure today to water down the word, to make it more politically correct, to make it more palatable, to take out things like hell. Well, we don't, let's not talk about hell. I mean, that's, that's going to really, people aren't going to like that. And they come to church. What do they come to church for, Jeff? They come to church to feel good. And you're talking to them about the highway to hell. They don't want to hear about the highway to hell. Maybe they don't want to hear about the highway to hell, but they need to hear about the highway to hell because if you're on the highway to hell, you need to get off of it.
So Paul said, hey, we don't water down the word. We tell you the truth. We tell you the truth. Now, in our world today, things related to sexual immorality, whether it be fornication, having sex before you're married, whether it be adultery, having sex outside of your marriage, whether it be homosexuality, having sex with someone of your own sex, those are all sin. They're all sins. It's all under the category of sin. And it has always been sin, and it will always be sin. And if Jesus tarries his coming a thousand years from now, it'll still be sin a thousand years from now. Why is that so important? Because unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You know, there was a church, Rosaria Butterfield, who was caught up in a lesbian lifestyle, professor at Syracuse University, very learned woman, very smart woman. She came to know Christ, and she goes around the country, and she shares, and she shares her story, and she lets people know you cannot Embrace that lifestyle and be a Christian. It's an impossibility. Just like you cannot embrace fornication, you cannot embrace, embrace adultery and, and say, well, that's fine before God. It's not. It's not. And she said she was in a church, and she said, I looked on the bulletin, and they had a little uh, blurb in the bulletin, how to be saved, how to become a Christian. And they had a suggested prayer, and this was the prayer. Dear God... I'm so sorry for my mistakes. Thanks for salvation. And Rosaria said, is that what it's come down to? We don't use the word sin anymore because that seems to, that's not PC, you know, that's not politically correct. So we change sin to be mistakes. And I'm sorry for my mistakes. Let me tell you what a mistake is. A mistake is something I did a couple of years ago when Matt Reynolds had knee surgery and I brought him home from the hospital and uh, being a good friend and a good pastor, I had him in the back seat. I was driving, I was being so careful, but I missed the exit for Kings Highway. Had to go all the way to Leary. That's a mistake. Matt's still upset about it, you know, because he's, he's dying in the back. Oh, please, I just wanna get home and the car's bouncing. He just had knee surgery. That was a mistake. A mistake is forgetting to put your name on your test paper. That's a mistake. A mistake is leaving the casserole in the oven a little too long and it burns. That's a mistake. That's not what sin is. Sin is high treason before a holy God. Sin is what sends you to hell. Mistakes don't send you to hell. And listen, if you make a mistake, you don't have to repent of that mistake. I said to Matt, man, Matt, I missed the exit. I, I got to go all the way to Dallas now. I mean, it's just a long way if you miss that exit. And, uh, but that was a mistake. That wasn't a sin. I didn't sin against Matt. Dear God, I'm so sorry for my sins. And Lord, my sins are so bad that caused you to go to the cross and die on a cross and shed your blood for my sins. My shaking my fist, so to speak, in your face. That is high treason before God. Oh, God, have mercy. I turn from my sins and I turn to the Savior. That's totally different than, Lord, I'm sorry for my mistakes. Thanks for salvation. Paul said, hey, we don't water down the word. We tell people the truth. We we're blessed by Emily Satterfield's testimony a few weeks ago. Emily, who has a testimony somewhat similar to Rosaria Butterfield and, and shared her testimony in our church, how God delivered her from uh, homosexuality. And I said, Emily, why did you start going to church here? And she said, because your church stands for the truth. And I wanted to be at a place, and I needed to be at a place that stood for the truth. I praise the Lord for that. So how can we be effective soldiers? We can remember what we've been given. Undeserved mercy, the ministry of reconciliation, that which every person needs. We can make sure our hearts are right with God so we really can shine. And we can't shine if we have secret sin and we can't make true disciples if we water down the word. And key number three, we can pray and we must pray. Prayer is so key. 
You know, we talk about the weapons in the Christian life, the weapons of our warfare. The Bible says they're not of the flesh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. What are the weapons as we're soldiers in the Lord's army? What are, the, what are our weapons? Well, our weapon is the word of God. It's called the sword of the spirit. That's our weapon. Another weapon is our witness for Christ as we shine, as we live a godly life, as we let people see that Jesus lives inside of us, as we clean up the windows, so to speak, so they don't get caked up with dirty sin and they're washed white and so the Lord can shine through us. We have not only our shining but our sharing as we open our mouths. That's a weapon as we share what the Lord has done for us. And then there's prayer. Prayer is a weapon. When Ephesians chapter 6, when he, the Apostle Paul talks about the armor of the Christian, he ends it by saying, and with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Prayer is what holds everything together. Prayer is powerful. Stephen Olford said this, where there is no passion for souls, there is no prayer. There is no prayer. When you don't see that people are one heartbeat from hell, then you don't really pray. George Mueller was a great, great man of faith, and he started the orphanages in England, and he was a man who just prayed. He believed that God answered prayer. He put five people, five unsaved friends of his, he put them on a prayer list, and he began to pray consistently for those five. One, first one of the five trusted Christ after just a few months of Mueller praying for him. Two more came to Christ 10 years later after Mueller prayed for them. The fourth guy on his list, he came to Christ after 25 years of George Mueller faithfully praying for his salvation. And the fifth guy came to Christ 52 years after George Mueller began to pray for him, he came to Christ at George Mueller's funeral. Man, there's, the, there's power in prayer to consistently pray, to not give up, to not throw in the towel, say, well, so-and-so, you know, old Jim, he's just hard-hearted. I'm not gonna pray for him anymore. No, you keep praying because God answers prayer. And the scripture says, and even if our gospel is veiled, verse three, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the glory, the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The devil is at work. And you know what he's at work doing? He's at work putting his hands in front of your eyes so that you cannot see, so that you're blind to the things of God. He, he, he sticks his fingers in your ears so you cannot hear. That's why Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Some people can't hear. They can't see. Their hearts are hard. And, and you talk to them and they say, well, I don't see that. So what do we pray? First of all, ask God to open blind eyes. To open blind eyes. When we pray for people who don't know Christ, whether it be a, a neighbor, a friend, a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, Somebody at school, somebody at work, you pray and you say, God, Satan has blinded their eyes. Lord, remove the blinders so that they can see. You know, a, a blind person, we know in the physical, a blind person can't see. They, no matter how much you talk to them about seeing, they say, well, I can't see that. Well, let me get some more light here. And you shine a light in their face. Well, I still can't see it. I'm blind. Dear lady in our church, Estelle Merrill, she's been a member here 25 years. I talked to her this morning. Such a sweet woman. She's been blind, as far as I know, from birth. And she and her husband, Bill, have a great marriage. And, and Estelle told me this story. I'd never forgotten it. She told me years and years ago. But she said that she was having trouble sleeping. And so she got up from bed in the middle of the night and began to do housework. And she was ironing the clothes in the laundry room. Well, Bill heard some noise, and so he gets up, and he flips on the light, and he sees Estelle ironing clothes. And he looked at her, and he said, what are you doing ironing in the dark? <laughs> she 
She said, I always iron in the dark. You know, I mean, <laughs> turning on the light doesn't mean anything. She can't see. We share the gospel with someone. You say, does this make sense to you? Do you understand this? And they say, I can't see it like that. I don't see what you're saying. They're not lying. They don't see. Why? Because the devil has blinded their eyes and the minds of the unbelieving that they might not, as the scripture says, see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So ask God to open blind eyes and ask God, secondly, to bring that lost one to his senses. To bring that person to a, a place where their heart is soft and they can see and they come to their senses and they realize, what does it mean when you come to your senses? You realize, I'm on the highway to hell. You know, it's, it's what the, happened to the prodigal son when he was at the pigsty and all of a sudden he came to his senses and he said, what am I doing here? I'm longing to eat pig food. My father's hired men don't eat pig food. I will get up. And I will go to my father and I will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your hired men. And he got up and he left the pigsty and he went to his father. That's because he came to his senses. We pray for people. What God, open their eyes. God, bring them to a place where they come to their senses and they understand you're a good God who loves them. You're a God who gave his son for them, who shed his blood, Lord Jesus, on the cross for them. I mean, the gospel is so wonderful. You'd have to be a fool to reject God's gift of love. Lord, help them to come to their senses. Prayer makes the difference. Last Sunday, we had our membership class. And every membership class, we kind of do it in, in parts. We have the first part, and then we break for dinner, and then we have the second part. And in the first part, I always share the gospel. Because I always tell people, listen, it doesn't matter if you join our church. If you haven't received Christ as Savior and Lord, you can join our church along with 100 others and that's not gonna make a difference. What makes the difference is being born again, giving your heart to Christ. And we always tell people this, we say, listen, we're gonna break for dinner now, and if you're not sure that you have a personal relationship with Jesus, you just stay seated, and we'll come by your table and talk to you about it. Well, I, there, was, uh, two, or there were two ladies. One was a young lady, one was uh, a mature lady, and, She's in her early 30s, and the other one was 13. So they're, they're, they're family members, and they're sitting at this table, Allison and Mackenzie, and I didn't know them, but I sat down and I said, where are you guys in this important question? And they just started to cry. And Allison was a Christian, but she said, my cousin Mackenzie, I asked her if she's ready if she knew that she was a Christian, she said she didn't. She wasn't ready, and she wants to be ready, and she wants to be saved. And Allison was crying, and Mackenzie was crying, and I started crying, and we prayed. And asked Jesus to come into her heart. And she was so excited, and I was excited, and Allison was excited, and both of them got baptized this morning. Mackenzie's aunt is Holly Hobbs. When Holly found out about it, she told me, she said, I've been praying for Mackenzie. She said, when we had our Christmas tree with the ornaments of people that we're praying for, I put Mackenzie's name down there and put it on the Christmas tree. And she said, I, I started praying for her kind of just intermittently, but then when we did that, that big push for the ornament, she said, I began to pray more earnestly. And I told my kids, and we all began to pray and she said, when I found out that Mackenzie gave her heart to Jesus, she said, I cried happy tears. And my kids shouted because they were so happy that God had answered their prayer. Hey, there is power in prayer to open blind eyes, to soften hearts, to dig out ears, to show people their need for Jesus. And listen, as we close out this series, I want to ask you, do you have someone in your life a friend, a neighbor, a loved one that doesn't know Christ. 
Have you thrown in the towel on prayer? Have you said, well, I've prayed for them before, but nothing's happening. They seem to be harder hearted now than they were before. I want you to pick up the towel and I want you to keep praying and keep believing God and keep asking God to open their eyes and to soften their heart. Listen, that person is one heartbeat from hell. When we lose our passion for souls, that's when we lose our prayer for souls. So as we close out today, as we have our invitation, I want to invite people to come to Christ so that they can be saved just as Mackenzie was saved. And I have a picture of Mackenzie and Allison. That's the three of us at the membership class. Maybe you're like Mackenzie and you say, Jeff, for the first time I see it and I want Christ to come into my life. We want to help you do that. But maybe you're here and you say, I know I'm a believer, but I've kind of lost sight of the fact that I'm in the Lord's army and I've really not been praying like I need to pray. Now I want to invite you to come to the front and I want to invite you to confess any secret sin to the Lord and to lift up the name of that one or those ones who need Jesus family members and friends and bring them before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to make a commitment to pray every single day for their hearts to be open, for their eyes to be open, for them to come to their senses so they can come to you. My friend, we've been talking about witnessing, shining for Christ and sharing your story. And here's the question. As you really think about this, do you have a story? Has the Lord really done a work of salvation in your heart? If not, today is the day for you. Just pray this prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe you rose again from the dead. And right now I ask you to forgive me of my sins to come into my life. I surrender my all to you. Be my Lord and Savior. I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and he'll give you a story to share of his glory and grace. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me. Please take the time to call that toll-free number Write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God. and You're important to us. And we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.